Well, we're going to have um, some time a little bit later for brainstorming and discussing um, these chapters two to three, but um, we're going to start out and I'm going to uh, kind of highlight some of the key concepts that the author talks about in chapters, I think we're on two and three. So good morning and thanks to Deb Sampson who is running the slideshow and she did a lot of uh, work on, I know this week and the previous week. This is the second forum on canoe. Carol, give your charger that portable charger. There you go, I was muted. Um, sorry that I was muted. Um, this is the second forum on canoeing the mountains, the book which the vestry and the visioning team is reading and sharing with the congregation. We're using this book for our Good Shepherd seasoning of visioning, which forms the second year of our priest in charge journey. So let's start off and um, look at what is the season of visioning at Good Shepherd. Our author of the book, Tom Todd Olsinger says, this is the moment when our congregation can take on a new life and begin a new season of faithful expression. This is not to throw the babies, and the babies are preaching, theology, pastoral care, liturgy, and programs out with the bathwater, as some might fear. Instead, we can start imagining different possibilities, and we can learn new ways of leading and I know we're talking about leading and Christian leadership here, and you may not consider yourself a leader, but please know that we are all experiencing the world now as volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that was even before COVID. The very process of navigating and thriving in this world, in mission for God, is transformational and requires the vocational transformation of the whole church as we jointly participate in God's transforming work in the world. So as we discussed here last week, we are now discovering new ways of doing church. The online community, renewing the daily office, and expressing gratitude outside of the Eucharist, to name a few. And remember last week when we learned that Lewis and Clark's expedition was built on a completely false expectation. They believed, like everyone before them, that the unexplored West was the same geography as the familiar East. So let's keep that in mind as we explore the book further. So we're going to um, hear the author explain his work using his metaphor of Lewis and Clark. And um, I think it's good to hear his actual voice in this process. So Deb, go ahead and start him. And I'm not hearing him, so you might wanna. Yeah, Deb, you, when, 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 you, when you've gone to share, you have to make sure that the computer sound is sent out. Did that help when I quit, when I unmuted myself? I found over and over again. Well, it's... When I get a moment, I'm on the computer, I was on the computer and just saying, whisper, complaint. Why didn't somebody ever forget me? It's not coming through very clear, Deb. When, when, you, when you need, when you uh, ask to share a screen down in the lower left-hand corner, there will, there's something that says share a computer sound, but you should be able to go into the... Um, into the little arrow next to share screen, advanced options, and make sure that you can share the computer sound. I don't s video settings. Um, the little where where you've got next to shared screen is the little arrow right, and advanced sharing options. Oh wait a minute. No. That's not where it is. 
Um, Oh, it should be uh, up in the view option. Uh, I think it, I think it's up. Yep, it's up in the where it says you're sharing your screen. Next to that, it says view options. You see that? Go to Portland, Maine to speak on Christian community, spiritual formation in the kingdom of God. I spoke to 240 people and then they gave them the opportunity to speak, to ask me questions after. But in the question answer time, no one wanted to speak about those topics. What everybody wanted to speak about was why is our church dying? That led me into a bit of a journey where I began to do more work in denominations and with churches. And I found that over and over again, through consulting and through coaching, when I would get a moment alone with a leader, I would often hear this same whispered complaint. Why didn't seminary prepare me for this? Lewis and William Clark had been sent by Thomas Jefferson to find a water route from St. Louis, Missouri to the Pacific Ocean, a water route that everybody thought was there. They had spent the winter with the Mandan tribe who told them that they could find their way to the Pacific Ocean, but they would have to climb over some mountains. What they thought were Appalachian Mountains. What they found were the Rocky Mountains. And so when they got there, they realized that a 300-year-old dream, finding a water route that would connect one side of the country to the other was gone. And in many ways, this is where Christian pastors find themselves. We have been prepared to be canoers. We have been trained and been equipped to become people who are really good with water routes. But what happens when there is no water route? What happens when you climb up over the top of a ridge, expect to see another river, begin to think you're going to go downstream and it's going to get easier and you find that exactly at the moment in your career when you hit a level of leadership you have to change everything so most pastors for example were trained for preaching and liturgics pastoral care programs uh, programs that assumed that there would be lots of people who would line up to fill them. VBSs that would be filled, um, Sunday school classes that would be filled, just needing someone to teach them well. Well, what happens when all of a sudden preaching, program, pastoral care are not enough because the culture has changed so dramatically that people aren't just showing up? What happens when you've been trained to be someone who will uh, take a congregation down a great river and just point out the sights along the way, and all of a sudden you realize that you've got to tell them they've got to drop the canoes, and they're now an expeditionary force that needs to go over a mountain, and even your congregation didn't sign up for this. What happens is it requires pastors and other Christian leaders to be really have a different kind of leadership than they were prepared for. Not just programmatic, not just preaching, not just lit liturgy or pastoral care, though those things are important, but also how do you actually lead a group of people to change, to grow, to look to their neighborhoods and look beyond themselves and become something different than they even expected to be so that they can fulfill the mission that God has them there for. So this book is about what it, what it takes to canoe over mountains when you run out of water and when you enter into uncharted territory into a new place that you're not prepared for. Ten years ago. Yep. So the author talks about these key leadership lessons that we're all struggling with now. Being trained for Christendom doesn't always prepare us to lead in uncharted territory. And in a moment of crisis, the temptation is to default to your training. And let's talk first about what is Christendom, because we, we heard it this morning in Gary's sermon, Father Gary's sermon. I had to look it up. I had to go back and sort of figure out what he's saying. And the author actually talks about this in the book. Sociologists and theologians refer to Christendom, this recently passed period of Christendom, as the 1700-year-long era 
placing Christianity at the center of Western cultural life. Christendom gave us things like blue laws and Ten Commandments in schools. For most of society, these days are long gone. And we can certainly argue that if it's the practice that's gone or the ethics that is gone, or perhaps both, but it is a new era. And Sundays are more about soccer and Starbucks than the Sabbath these days. So being trained for Christendom doesn't always prepare us to lead in uncharted territory. Here he's talking about the status quo mindset, traditional thinking and practices which support programmatic churches, still functioning as vendors of religious services for a Christian culture. When confronted by the mountains of change, we canoers will default to the expectation that while looking for the water route, the mountains in the west are the same as the mountains in the east, and we will act accordingly. But remember our purpose of vocational transformation. Bolsinger says, churches need to keep adventuring or they will die. We need to press on into the uncharted territory of making traditional churches into missionary churches. And that's the linchpin, being missional, embracing a certain posture, thinking, behaviors, and practices in order to reach others with the mes message of the gospel. Being missional, which separates congregations that are primarily maintaining the old culture and practices from those fundamentally defined by their calling and sending to do God's purpose. And as Father Gary talked about in this week's video message, we need to hold on to the adventure that God has set before us now. We need to hold on to the new adventure to learn our true strengths and purpose when we come out the other side. So with that in mind, let's take a deeper dive into the book. And Deb, if you would move ahead, let's all unmute ourselves and brainstorm a list of ways that the world and the church has changed in your lifetime. And church can be the church institution, the Episcopal church, Good Shepherd in particular. We're not going to um, limit it to a particular church. So, um, Deb will capture our comments in um, the table. Go ahead, anyone. Well, I have, uh, my memories of Sunday were that nothing was open, basically. <clears throat> Maybe the gas station, a few little things. You might, as a family, go for a ride, but otherwise it was church and home. Out to eat with family, <clears throat> maybe close friends, but that was it. Now it's... Now everything is Sunday because that's the one day that everybody seems to be off of everything else but church. Does it capture it if I say no Sunday blue laws? Yes, it does. Okay. Well, in the church, when I was growing up, girls couldn't be acolytes. We didn't have um, <coughs> women who were priests. Again, Ellen, does that catch your capture your i'm on an iphone so i can't read what you said without reading glasses on sorry okay. increased role of women in leadership roles in church perfect okay and in everything not just church yeah well you yeah and deb you've got that in the world section although that was a church a church comment okay let me take that out of the church and put it in or out of the world and put it in the church <laughs> Oh, 
Well, with church, we've become more inclusive instead of divisional with the theology, with our stance and belief systems. That was always something very obvious growing up. Give that back to me I, again. I'm not capturing it well. Okay. Uh, the church has become more inclusive instead of divisive. Well, clearly, this is a world comment, although it's certainly affecting the church, is the fact that we're actually able to have this conversation from um, at least 30 different rooms um, scattered <laughs> around, you know, the technology, uh, the, it's both a, a positive and a negative. I mean, if, if it weren't for technology, we wouldn't have COVID-19, but if it weren't for technology, we wouldn't be able to have this meeting. So it's just a thing. Another difference is that when I was growing up, most of the women I knew, the mothers, were at home. And now most of the mothers have uh, careers. That goes back to including women in leadership roles in the community rather than just in the church. Along back in the olden days when I was a kid, uh, women had three choices. You could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, you could be a secretary. Those were it. And uh, none of those were world leadership kinds of positions. And as we have changed in the world, the church has changed too, as far as meeting it. The way in which the rules of women have changed also changed the church because the church was dependent on groups of women to get most of whatever it was doing done. That's still true now that we're out doing things as far as worldly things. <laughs> I think that's been, that's been true forever and ever. Whatever needs to be done, you can count on the woman to step up and get it done because she seems to be the one who can multitask better for some, for some reason. Or at least is willing to take to take that on. I think another big change that uh, that I've seen in the church because I'm a music person um, is we've gone um, we've started to allow contemporary music. You know, we have the supplements to the hymnal, and we have some more relaxed services that when I was growing up, you just didn't have. That was what the kids did at retreats, but it was not what the adults did in a service. I think the kids just brought their retreats into the service when they came up to be adulthood, which is a good thing. I think another thing that's changed, and this isn't, not, it's, it's not so much technology, is that the world has gotten smaller. I mean, we are a global society now. We are, it's, it's not um, limited to, you know, the village and the houses around the village. It's, we can't do what we do as a, as, as, um, as a society without dependence on things that are happening halfway across the world. And that means <clears throat> that we've got influences coming in um, from, from different places. So those can be societal in, uh, influences. They can also be religious influences. The fact that, you know, people talk about Jubus and, and things like that, that there's this, this collation of, of, uh, 
of religious worldviews and things like that. We're, we're just cheek by jowl with so many different folks that we weren't when I was growing up. Um, you know, the quote minority makeup of my high school meant that there were three kids there who were not Anglos. <laughs> I have often said that my cul-de-sac, on my cul-de-sac are representatives of four of the major five world religions. Um, so that's where we live. Part of the problem is that people are unwilling to change and listen to other beliefs and other societies and so forth. Even if you live with them, are you making an effort to learn about them? And I think that may be a problem in some areas of the country more than others, but that's part of the problem, I think. So Elaine, are you saying that some people need to accept change? Most people need to ex accept change? What are you seeing in your viewpoint? I'm sure this is a limited viewpoint, but <clears throat> I think people are so separated and unwilling to consider other beliefs. And I think that's not just locally, I think it's worldwide. It's, goes back to how we were raised and so forth. I think we all need to be more willing to accept change. So Deb, um, when I, I had to go back and get my baptismal certificate a while back and I found out um, in 1956, I was baptized in a Methodist church in Seattle, Washington with 50 other babies. And the church secretary told me that was very commonplace in those days to have large baptisms frequently. I'm not, I'm not seeing that so much. I'm not being judgmental, I'm just putting that out there. I was kind of surprised, but um, she said that was very common. She had to go down and find my name in the book in the church basement, and it was several books for 1956, apparently. Wow. Baby boom. Mm -hmm. I wish name to add something. Church. I wish to add something on the point about more inclusive instead of divisive. I will never forget a sermon at North Presbyterian Church in Denver. Pope John Paul was in office and he had had the ecumenical council and Dr. Moss preached that the people that were attending St. Catherine's down the street on Federal were Christians also. Now that division was real. I was a little frightened to introduce Wally to my dad because Wally was a baptized and confirmed Roman Catholic. You didn't do that. Kids were families disowned children who married out of the faith. Mm -hmm. And today we still have Christians who want to say there's only one way to find God. And I think that that's one of the, one of the most important missions that we have that there isn't just one way to know God. I would also say that there is um, a lot of, of assumption when you say you're Christian. Uh, that it seems to me that Christianity has divided into sort of a fundamental branch and a liberal branch or progressive branch and that if you are a member of a progressive branch and you say that you're a Christian you will see 
people react to that because they have only heard of the more conservative approaches. Um, and so there's a division in Christianity and people carry a grudge, I think, against it um, out there. I think that liberal versus progressive has always been there. At least it has been in my 75 years of life. And to me, one of the most important things that I gained from what I would probably consider in the 19, late 40s, early 50s, a more moderate church um, was that you could always ask questions. You could always learn. There wasn't any evil attached with saying, is there really a God or not a God? And that key is so crucial to the mission. It's okay to ask questions. And I'm not going to call you a name because you're questioning. And I, and I think that's particularly true of younger people and younger to me as anybody who in their 40s or less and i i think that they don't so. they weren't raised in the church so they don't always have something tied there and there were so many no's you can't do this you can't do that you can't do the other thing so i still think that the mission is important in terms of asking questions I'm having trouble figuring out where I'm going to put that on this brainstorming. Oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's capture that. I want to church. capture it. I just don't know quite under church. Yeah, yeah. It's a church thing. It's the ability to ask questions. Is there a God? Is there not a God? I think you could put it partly under liturgy. This is an honor. Because at baptism, one of my favorite Parts is when we all pledge to uh, support the child in many ways and including having an inquiring heart and that that basis that uh, thirst to look at things and uh, start maybe doubting or just not knowing or whatever uh, starts at the very beginning of uh, in a sense a person's life in the church and maybe we don't uh, about that enough. I don't know. <clears throat> was growing up, um, we were all more in touch with immigrant roots. We were all one generation closer to those people who came from the old country, be it Ireland or Germany or Italy. And um, today, people don't, um, aren't in touch with their personal immigrant roots. Um, and I think that that leads to that division of you know, um, being American, not German American. Deb, I would disagree with that. I would say that the European immigrant folk may not be so tied into where, where their immigrate, immigrant uh, roots are, but I would say that folks from South Asia or uh, the Middle East or South America, Latin America, probably are still pretty well tied. I would. Um... Yeah, I, I don't think I said that very well, but I think I, I think um, when you are in in touch with your European immigrant roots, it makes you more accepting of immigrants with other roots, which might be African or whatever. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, 
I, I'm not to, so sure of that either because I am half Swedish, a quarter Danish, and a quarter all sense Lorraine French, and I've known that all my life. And I, I, um, my grandmother Johnson was unhappy that my father was going to marry a non Swede. <coughs> so that business has been around, but she also said to her children, I'm not teaching you Swedish, you're American, you learn English. And that was definitely a feeling of the immigrants in the 1800s and early 1900s. You will learn the language of the country you're living in. So hey, Deb, that's, Deb, keep that's that been on. an issue. Yeah. I'll check it out. <laughs> Maybe the only one who sees it that way. No, let's well, keep that on and let's, let's go forward to the next slide because I think we're okay. in this. Put it back on. I, I don't want to type anymore. <laughs> Let's let's advance because I think we're getting into this area. Um, what e on on the items that we captured? What evokes strong reaction? We've already gotten some strong reaction. What resonates with you? What challenges you? Dan, can you can you answer that? Well, what challenges me is that I I see so many people. Um, a, a large seg a large vocal segment of our population um, hating people who've come from other countries. And I know darn good and well, many of them are second or third generation away from their own immigrant roots. And so when you can't, when you're, when you're not thinking about your own immigrant roots, it's easier to be um, hateful toward other immigrants, I think. Deb, I think part of that may come because as various waves of immigrants came in, they were they came in as the lowest group on the totem pole, so to speak, whether it was Italians or Germans, mm -hmm. various groups that came through. And right. so perhaps that attitude of being not quite good enough because they were a dago or a chink or a whatever the common term was for that particular group was used derogatorily and so their parents passed on the attitude of don't be like that because that's not good enough. It'll make your way better if you ad adapt to a different society, which is the one that we're in, which is the quote unquote American society, which really integrates everybody but those at various points, each group was on the outside looking in. Spanish immigrants have been here longer than most European immigrants. Oh, I, I, I still have. So we talk about perceptions, not. Yeah. Not talk about reality. Indians who were here originally have always been. Oh, the yeah, they most always get dumped. Yeah. Indians. Okay, so it's not just. That it's not necessarily a reality, but it is how it was perceived and how each group tried to move themselves up and out of that underclass and into the next level of society. Not only that, but the mm -hmm. fact that the English won the wars and the English were members of the Church of England for the most part, or they were the Puritan branch, which became the Congregational Church, they believed that they had God's will behind them and that it was the destiny for them to Christianize everyone. The, the Native American schools, children were taken away from their families, put in these schools to be educated. They had to use English. They could no longer use Navajo or Ute or what have you, the Lakota Sioux. They were, um, they were to be assimilated into the dominant English culture. If you were in Colorado, the Spanish population was Roman Catholic and we were, we were dominantly Protestant. And so they weren't right because they didn't believe the right way. I had, when I lived in Greeley, one of my good friends in the League of Women Voters remembers the day that at St. Peter's, the oldest Catholic church in Greeley, the priest told them they were building a 
search for you people, meaning those with Spanish surnames and darker skin in North Greeley. And those people had to sit in the balcony of the church. They couldn't be down on the main floor. So think about where we are today. But I, I go back to that song from South Pacific, you've got to be taught before it's too late that you have to hate. And that's one of the problems with facing all of us. And I think it's a key piece of our mission is to stand up against that hate and, <laughs> and we need to do it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I think, I think what, what, what we're hearing here um, is similar to this shift from Christendom. It's the question of, of the dominant um, culture, religion, ethnicity, whatever, um, I don't want to say coming under attack, uh, because I don't think that it is, but it is waning um, in what I've already observed as an increasingly globalized society. And that freaks people out. And, um, and so the, the U.S. has been um, predominantly Anglo, whether that's been Roman Catholic or Protestant, it's been predominantly Anglo. And so regardless of your original roots, you start looking at other people who don't look that way, and they're the problem. Um, whether they're coming from south of the border or whether they're coming across the Pacific or coming across the Atlantic. So whether it's that or, oh golly, Christianity doesn't look like it used to, I think we've got to deal with what's changing. And this is the point about Christendom. What's changing is that reality is gone. And so many of us are unwilling to let go of it. Rant off. <laughs> No, that's great. Let's let's ask ourselves: In what ways have we been unprepared to lead in, or we have been prepared to lead in this changing world? And in what ways do we feel ill-equipped? And I will just offer up this: What I read about COVID adversely affecting certain populations in our country. I feel, you know, I'm able to work from home in my cozy white collar job. I don't go out. I'm not on the front lines. I, I don't face that. So I'm having a very different COVID experience that than um, first responders, healthcare providers, and minorities in this country. It makes me feel ill-equipped. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have an idea? Well, what we're seeing and what needs to be addressed again, once more, into the breach, dear friends, is the inequality of incomes. It is people who don't have a lot of money often live in family units. That is certainly true in New York City. Now, maybe not Manhattan, but you get out in the boroughs, Grandma and Grandpa are in the same house because they originally bought it or their parents bought it and we're going through the generations. So I think that the issue about people having enough money coming in that they can have shelter, they have a means of getting food, they have the ability to have health care. I think those are all things that as Christians we need to say, yeah, that's, that's crucial. Because if those basic needs aren't met, then we're not going to get any, any further. And it's hard to say, well, I don't want to support some lazy bum sitting on the couch eating potato chips or whatever. That's not true of most people who are in that economic bracket. It is absolutely not true. It's a stereotype. So I, I think that we're seeing the price of the income inequality that we have in this country. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so preachy. Part of the uh, thing we're reading about with COVID now about different populations being more affected goes back to the housing situation because yes. they are not able to socially distance. There may be eight or 10 of them crammed in a 
two bedroom house or with so that's a massive problem. And that leads to the reporting of the cultural differences. But that's not just cultural because the other population largely impacted by this COVID are senior citizens in what we used to call nursing homes or in group living situations. Um, and there, that's a huge, huge percentage of the deaths from COVID-19. Well, the Native American population has also been very um, mm -hmm. hard hit, and they tend to live more in um, unique family groups, individual family groups, and have somewhat more space, particularly in the reservations, which is where the biggest hit has occurred. But they don't have the facilities to do the sort of hygiene that, because they don't have running water, for example, many times out in the middle of nowhere. So they really get it. They're just, everybody's there, everybody there is going to happen. Plus yeah. they don't have the good, the better health to start with. They don't have the better health. They haven't had better health care all along that many of us have been fortunate enough to enjoy. I think one of the biggest like problems right now is communicating with people who might not have the technology but also students who have like this idea of how things are going to work out and then they change and you don't know how to deal with it or the teachers who all of a sudden just have to learn how to teach online i think that there are problems with other situations but i think a lot of it has to do with the education system okay um can you advance the slide deborah okay so remember last week ellen suggested that you talk to a trusted advisor about the learning questions she presented um and i'm curious are any of you using a trusted companion or advisor if not we're going to offer up these questions as individual reflection for the coming week and i'm sure these will be posted um on the website or um, made available to everyone to refer back to. Um, so the coming week, think about ways that you have um, seen yourself defaulting to the old ways and um, particularly at times when you should be looking for new ways of doing things. What characteristic could you better develop and how well do you respond to people who insist on living in the past? And um, that can be very complex. I'm a person who is comfortable with living in the past, but I'm also a person who's comfortable looking towards the future. So you might explore that if, you're, if you have similar, similar things. Um, does, let's see, and do you want to advance one more, Deborah? Um, for the practice of these principles, we suggest that you seek voices or opinions different from your own. And this is so important. Listen with empathy and understanding. O employ those open listening techniques, um, not to change views, but to truly listen to the other person or group of people. We've been talking about similar things here. Take up a new hobby. <laughs> um, that's something that you can explore, certainly, to experience how you are being a learner. And does anyone, and do you want to advance one more? Deborah, next week, um, Consider doing the exercise either on your own or with a trusted companion. Do the exercise on embodying leadership. And next 
Sunday, we will be doing chapters four through six. So I'm going to invite um, any closing comments now, if anybody wants to share anything. I would just like to say thank you, you guys. Um, I think it's, um, it's hard to think about some of these some of these things and it's hard to admit that you have shortfalls um and i think that this is just a really great exercise for us so thank you you're welcome thank you deb for doing so much work on this glad to do it <laughs> and i think um we're going to now go into a little break time and then coffee hour so thank you all for